James Lofton, the Hall of Famer, is uh, sitting down. In fact, he's uh, signing our Super Bowl helmet there, the first to do so. Uh, last year he was with us. It was raining. You brought in yes, the umbrella from raining. Michael Irvin. Yes, I did. <laughs> Uh, come on inside if you're uh, watching on TV, Audience Channel 239, Direct TV, and the NBC Sports Network. James will be working sidelines for Westwood radio coverage of the Super Bowl, along with uh, Mark Malone. Uh, Kevin Harlan, Boomer Esiason will be in the booth. I told these guys, if you watch a game on the sidelines, yes. you wouldn't want to play the game or let your kids play. That, I mean, that my feeling when I saw it, I saw a Bengals game back when Boomer Esiason was playing mm -hmm. quarterback. And the hits and the speed, TV doesn't do it justice. <laughs> when you're on the sidelines, can you believe you played that game? It, it is different. And even when, when I got to coach, when I, when I went into coaching, I would watch my players, and it takes some getting used to because you care about your guys a lot. You receiver coach, you're kind of like a surrogate parent to them. And then you watch them get hit. <laughs> and you think, okay, get up, go back to the huddle, and it is. The, the speed of the game is what everybody talks about. And what's interesting, you see coaches every once in a while who are standing very close to the sideline. And even in college football where they're actually on the field, you know, Mike Tomlin thought he was in college football for a little while. But you get that close to the field. And when that action comes in your direction, you almost expect the players to avoid you. But some of the players will look and they'll say, okay, opposing coach, I'm going to take this guy out. And he, you know, so you, you Did you be ever try to do that? I never put a shoulder into anybody who was coming toward the sideline because I understand that I'm not playing anymore. Some of the coaches, they get fired up for game day and they think, you know, they, they want to put on eye black, they want to tape their ankles and do all that. I've been down that road before. Do you think Tomlin did that on purpose against the Ravens? I think Tomlin is a very astute coach. I think he was very aware of where he was in his positioning all on right, the field. All right, Stanford guy, just answer the question. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, <there you> go. <laughs> I, I had a question. Have there always been four Danettes, or is this something that has grown? We had three, and then McLovin showed up and wouldn't leave. <laughs> um, we did have, there were five candidates to be Danettes, and I only took four. And the one guy that I didn't take is Jim Parsons, who's now the star of the Big Bang oh. Theory. Yeah. So one of these guys McLovin. could have been on one of my favorite shows. McLovin. You would have been? Yeah, would nerdy. Have been you? Yeah. I would have been on the Big Bang Theory. Is that how it would have worked? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. You, so it would have been you and Amy, huh? Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. Your Zinga. love interest. Yeah. As a uh, Hall of Fame wide receiver, if I said you could play with Peyton or Russell Wilson. Ooh. How old am I? 28. 28. So I'm in the kind of prime of my athletic career. And... Am I going to get to change? Am I in a contract year? <laughs> if, I'm in a, if, I'm in a, if I'm in a contract year, I want to play with Peyton Manning. If I am starting, a, if I, if I'm starting a contract, I'll play with Russell Wilson because he's going to be there okay. another five, six years. The difference. Boy, the tight road, huh? Just right and, down and, the middle. And here he, and I know. Every time I ask you a question, you ask me a question. Why is it? Because you can't handle the truth. <laughs> no, I can. <laughs> uh, but I look at Russell Wilson. I think there's more pressure on Russell Wilson than people are leading on here that he didn't play well the last six weeks of the season. Right. Everybody makes this about Peyton Manning. Is it Peyton Manning, win or lose, he's going to be the story? I, I think he is a huge part of the story. The, the, you know, one of the underlying things, you know, you have the number one scoring offense, the number one scoring defense. The last time that happened, Super Bowl 25, the Bills against the New York Giants. And I was in a car just this weekend in uh, Houston with Lawrence Taylor. And so Lawrence gets in the car, and we're talking, and I say, well, who do you like in the game? Wait, 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 wait. What are you doing in a car with Lawrence we're Taylor? At, we're going to an autograph show. Oh, okay. So I asked him, I said, who do you like in the game? And he says, I like Denver. I said, well, you, you know the last time this was set up was our game. He goes, so, so Seattle's kind of like the Giants. He says, I like Seattle. <laughs> 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 so it, it's, it's a game where... If you can talk about one team for 10 minutes and talk yourself into that team, talk about the next team for 10 minutes and talk yourself into that team. Uh, it, it's got to be the best matchup on paper that we potentially could have had. Because even last week's game, if I told you back in August, take your bias out from your favorite team. Mm -hmm. Who would you like to see in the AFC championship game? Who would you like to see in the NFC championship game? And in August, you were giving me those four teams. So we got those teams. We had great games. And now the buildup with Peyton 
with Russell Wilson, with Richard Sherman, with the coaches, I, I think it's great. I thought Richard Sherman was scripted. Like, this is what he wanted to do, that, that he set out, because nobody knows defensive players anymore. Right. That's, you can't make a name for yourself like you used to be able to, unless you do something controversial. You can be a great player. Earl Thomas, nobody talks about Earl Thomas. Correct. Chancellor, nobody talks about him. But it, but it really is personality-driven. His personality is a little different. Um, let's go back to Tom Brady. The comment that he had with him, are, are you mad, dude, or, or whatever he bro, said to him, yeah. bro. And so that kind of started it. The, the ability to trash talk is, is kind of a lost art. But Richard Sherman has brought it back. The, the Legion of Boom is good because when he went on the rant, the last thing he said was L-O-B. And I thought, L-O-B, that must be some derogatory term. So I'm searching, it's just Legion of Boom. And, but, but I thought that it, it really meant something controversial, but that was like L-O-B out, you know. And so they have that moniker. Yeah. And, you know, they are great secondary, but throw in a dash of trash talk, and, and now you've, you've got something that everybody wants to But taste. how does that affect you as a wide receiver? Did you have somebody oh, who talked a lot? Oh, it, it would have... It would affect me as a player. It would have affected me as a coach because you have to warn your players that this is coming. And not only is it coming, but he's pretty good. So you factor in both of those things. The one thing about Richard Sherman, and I've known him since his freshman year at Stanford, when you go to a Seahawk game, players filter out onto the field an hour early, two hours early. Richard is out there. He's out there with one of the quality control guys, and he's working on his ability to stay square at the line of scrimmage. And by that, he doesn't turn his shoulders. He slides with the guy, slides with mirrors him. He'll do this for 30 minutes. Then you, you fast forward to the game, and he's doing the exact same thing. So it's really technique driven. If, if you were to unmike him and just put a camera on him, you would say, this guy has great technique. He, he is in the mold of Mike Haynes and Lester Hayes. He's kind wow. of a cross between the two of them. But when you know, people label him thug. Now, now, see, when I was growing up, somebody yeah. would be a thug when they would beat me up and take my lunch money. It had nothing Correct. to do with color. You know, because, you know, the dreads, well, well, the on, on the field, he is a thug. He beats up receivers and he takes their lunch money. <laughs> yeah. But we, we put race into it yeah. because of thug. You know, that, that's where I got a little... I, I, we, we projected our opinions on that mm -hmm. interview. And, and we were looking for our story, our narrative, our opinions, our bias, and we put it in there, a 27-second interview. But when I heard Thug, and then he said, you know, that's a way to call somebody the N-word without calling him that. Yeah. That's pretty Well, well it, that's, it's, that's it, deep. it's probably a notch below the N-word in terms of being a derogatory term. And it's a derogatory term for all the things that he overachieved that where he grew up in Compton was an area that was infested with with gang violence mm. he was no part of that he goes to Stanford he graduates on time he does all all the right things off the field in terms of charity work it's interesting when you're in the Seattle area you see some of the commercials that he has on one for education that's on television you go man what a guy but then you have to face him on the field and there's an alter ego and it's kind of like he's a superhero because that, that alter ego You've got to be Dr. Evil if you're going to play on defense. You talk to a lot of defensive guys. Lawrence Taylor, we were talking about, he, talk, he said unnecessary roughness. He said there's no such thing as roughness that's not unnecessary on the football field. <laughs> <laughs> but you have these personalities, and, and you have to shed that personality. You can't be the same person yeah. on the field as off the field, and I'm sure you know, Richard Sherman is the same way. We're talking to James Lofton, the Hall of Famer. Before I let you go, your prediction is? Yeah. <sighs> Uh, what are you, Chris Berman it, it, here? It, 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 it is so hard because I was, I was in Seattle last week, and, and you get what, what they call 12th man fever. They have had 95 consecutive sellouts, and the, the crowd's been a factor in all those games. Well, I, I looked it up. Denver's had 360 <laughs> consecutive sellouts. So I like Peyton. There are a lot of Stanford guys on the S Seattle team, so – I can win either way with this one. It feels like the offense should win because I'm an offensive player. So for that, I'm leaning a little bit, but the wind is blowing strong in the other direction. My goodness, James, just answer the question. <laughs> McLovin, help me out here. <laughs> you, you like the Broncos. Uh, I like the Broncos. There That's what go. he said.
He's James Lofton. He'll be working the sidelines for uh, Westwood, <laughs> Westwood One radio coverage of uh, the Super Bowl. Mark Malone, Boomer Science, and Kevin Harlan. Always great to see you, James. Thanks Same for stopping here. by.